I was founder of Erickson Living. I was in leisure housing in Florida back in the 70s. I did some golf course communities and some manufactured housing and stick milk communities, fairly moderate income, but nice things for the people retiring at age 60, coming out of New Jersey and places like that. And I always wanted to say, for every one person that came to Florida, 20 stayed home for the right reasons, family, churches, community. But what we really need to do is create communities that they would be interested in moving to, not when they're 60, but when they're 75. And so when I came across the St. Charles College at the time, it was an abandoned Catholic seminary sitting on 100 acres in Catonsville. And I thought, okay, here's my chance to prove my theory. Two things that I did that changed the rules for the industry. One was to get to middle America, you needed to have a program different than the endowment communities that were being built where you had to give up 150 or $200,000 to get into it. If I gave a refundable entrance deposit, you could have your money back anytime you leave or die. And that would be available then to middle America that had housing equity of $100,000 or 150,000. So by doing a refundable entrance deposit, I got way down from the top market to the middle income market. The second thing I did was I went to a fee-for-service plan and said, I put in this basic service package that included the main meal, utilities, taxes, transportation, the medical clinic, things of this type. But it was cheap enough that you actually saved money living in the retirement community than you would if you were in your individual house. Those two ingredients made this a real find for anybody that had owned their home and had social security. 70% of the senior market could get to my housing product. So I got a $5 million bank loan, a $2 million guarantee from Geico, and I started moving residency in. I spent the next uh, 30 years developing the capital market to say, go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And that's how I was able to take that first project and expand it across the country and do 23 of these super mega campuses for 3,000 people. Instead of building the typical 200 unit community that the industry was building, I was building these 2,000 and 2,500 unit campuses. So I was housing 3,000 people. It's hard to get to know 3,000 people. So I came up with this idea of putting in a local TV station in each of the communities. And I put in my hometown TV station with a few cameras and a couple sets, and then the veterans club and the, the bridge clubs, the bowling leagues, everything would come in on, use the television, they would promote what they're doing in the community. And that little hometown television became a huge communication source. And I thought the 50 plus market really wants to hear more about themselves than anybody really knows. That's what gave me the, desire to say, why don't I put together a national program speaking to the 50 plus audience instead of just purely local. I wanted to be an aggregating source for 50 plus content. And I don't care whether it was an RV travel show or whether it was a health series or financial planning, any, any of those categories would have fit. And, and I wanted to be the place where people would say, well, you want their, your show on that network but it took us so long to get to 30 million homes, I never got to the position that I was able to create the aggregation that we needed. I think when we get to this age, you have to maintain your good health and your attitudes. And so probably the most important thing is to stay active. Here's the thing about America, that we have a huge ageism bias. We don't want to deal with getting older. And it's too bad because, hey, it's something you're not going to avoid. And that was what I spent my whole life on was telling people, it's okay to be older. Get ready for the fact that you're not going to be needed in the productive work environment much longer. And so you may spend 30 years of doing nothing in the productive work environment. Now, most people can't come to grips with that, but that's the way life is. Well, that's really difficult for people that have defined themselves through their work product. It's going to be a shock. And so I would tell 60 year olds, find out what it is that you would like to do in those 30 years that gives you a sense of dignity and worth and purpose. What I enjoy most about senior life is uh, looking back on what my path was, what I accomplished. It, the family is a big piece of it. How your kids turned out, what are they doing? How independent are they? Watching grandkids grow up. Uh, 
and then thinking about all the opportunities that I had and, and the places where I made a difference. The uh, cultural structure of America, we define ourselves by what we do. And so when you are not any longer doing, well, then you can't be worth anything. And that's not true. As you move into this elderhood range, one of the hardest things is that transition from defining yourself by what you do and learning to be who you really are. So I went from being a, a CEO of a company with 12,000 people to Mr. Fix-It. But actually I get as much fun out of that as I probably did of uh, being a CEO. In doing my work with the seniors, I called it the six pillars of successful aging. They start with, uh, one is nutrition uh, and learning to eat well. If you're living by yourself and you're fairly isolated and you're down to Campbell's soup and snack foods, that's not healthy. So the second one is some exercise. You know, you've got to keep the engine running. It used to be people would say, take it easy, but the reality is, it's use it or lose it. People would think of relaxation as sitting and watching NFL games and, you know, that's not, that's not that healthy. The other couple of pillars that I had, one is socialization. It's really important to maintain your social structure. Social isolation kills more seniors than any of the diseases uh, because people get isolated, that turns to depression and all the other bad habits that go with it. The last two are financial security. If seniors have a position where they are financially stable and their house equity, like living in a community, and their income is basic and they've got everything covered, they'll live fine. But if you don't have financial stability and you're worried to death every day where it's gonna come from, and you're swapping off food for prescriptions, you're not gonna live well. And then the last one, one that I learned sort of accidentally was a person's spiritual well-being. Do you really deal with the spiritual issues of your life? Have you reconciled the conflicts and everything? And uh, if you've done that, you're okay for a very healthy uh, aging process. Mm -hmm.